Just one more level of people looking at things. When I wrote the the Kenobi novel, the uh, the Knight Errant novel, um, you know, this was, uh, and then the Knights of the Old, Re Old Republic comics. The notion had been that George Lucas was probably not returning to Star Wars for anything, and we were very close to uh, being not the only game in town, but there was not anything else really going on until he started w up with the Clone Wars, and even Clone Wars was a situation where that's any particular point of the time frame and. All my stuff is in the Old Republic. It's it's quite some time distant from that, uh, and so I wasn't colliding with anything. Um, what happened uh, with uh, with New Dawn, which uh, incidentally is uh, is uh, nine years old today, <laughs> as, I was, <laughs> yes. as I found out, uh, it is uh, it was the case that uh, I was two thirds of the way through working on that novel. Um, I noticed that we we're doing something unusual with it, which is that uh, because it was a prequel to the Rebels TV series, I was being uh, overseen by people that were aware of the TV show. So I had Dave Filoni and uh, Greg Wiseman and Simon Kinberg who were all looking at the outlines and they had suggested possible things I could write about where I wouldn't collide with things. And then I had some freedom within that to choose what exactly I wanted. I, I wanted to write about how Kanan and Hera met because my feeling was the longest, oh, I, I, the farthest I could get away from the actual events of the TV show, the better for me. Uh, because I wouldn't have other characters to collide with or other histories that I have to learn. We had gone through this this process, and I'd had uh, you know, a conference call with what turned out to be the Lucasfilm story group as this book is developing, and then I'm two-thirds of the way through, and they say, hey, we need you to come out to Lucasfilm because you know, you're going to end up doing a, uh, a, a video with, uh, as it turned out, Timothy Zahn was there, and we... <laughs> We ended up uh, doing a video about declaring everything prior to A New Dawn Legends and everything forward is you know, part of the Lucasfilm Story Group uh, era, so to speak. But basically what it means now is that uh, there are people in the story group that have an eye on everything that is going on in other parts of the franchise, films, TV, other things, uh, toys, action figure, the backs of the cards even, the video games. Uh, they have all these things that they're aware of. <laughs> Uh, and so they can actually they can actually cue us in to opportunities and things to avoid. And uh, that's, you know, that is something that did happen before, uh, but uh, this is a little bit more structured, I would say. Mm -hmm. Speaking of anniversaries, congratulations on 10 years of Kenobi. Yeah, like 10 years <laughs> of Kenobi, that, uh, that was last week. Uh, yeah. I, I wrote Kenobi and New Dawn back to back. In fact, the last line of Kenobi is the first <laughs> line of a New Dawn. Uh, also spoken by Obi-Wan. Um, yeah, uh, Kenobi, it is uh, a book that uh, we did not know how well it would go over because it was not a typical uh, Star Wars novel. It, uh, we did not have any lightsaber fights. We did not have any space battles in it. It was really more of a Western, and 90% of it was told from the point of view of other characters. It became something that was both a New York Times bestseller, but you know, also a Scribe Award winner, and then and just continued to uh, to go on, and now it's in many different languages, and you know there's there's uh, hundreds of thousands of copies out there, and uh, they've done in the past year uh, not just the essential edition, um, uh, essential legends edition of Kenobi, uh, but Barnes and Noble has done Tales of Kenobi, which is a gift edition that includes my book plus the Approaching Storm by Alan Dean Foster in this. You know, sort of faux leather uh, replica of the original hardcover, which people kind of need now because the original hardcover, you know, I would probably charge two hundred dollars for if I had any. Uh, that's about what they go for on eBay. Um, but you know, and we have that, and then we had the TV show, and and it was gratifying that <laughs> Ellen McGregor and and Deborah Chow, the director, both did video interviews talking about the novel. And I was going to bring that up. Yeah. How they yeah. how they took some inspiration from it. They obviously couldn't tell the same story because they were ten years later and my story is an arrival story, but they didn't overwrite anything in the story, and they, they took a major element uh, from our book uh, and used it in the show. And again, it depends on whether people want spoilers or not, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I guess spoilers. The whole thing about um, you know, Qui-Gon Jinn not responding to Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon ghosting Obi-Wan, huh? <laughs> well, that, that's from us. Uh, yeah. We actually yeah. Yeah, thought really hard on that, and I determined in the book that, yeah, I wanted him not to actually hear from Obi-Wan, not to hear from Qui-Gon, 
because I'm trying to you know, underline that uh, he's going to be alone, that he's got to figure out how to do this thing uh, as a hermit. Oh, sorry. I love a good, bad pun. Thank you. <laughs> that, well, there's, there's, there's one of several. So knowing that your book was such an inspiration, that Deborah Chow like, took inspiration, like, like, how does it... Is it kind of like watching your child grow up and evolve? Uh, you know, there are various things that happen. Uh, you know, we don't own these characters. Or th these are all uh, projects that we're working for another franchise. And so you will see characters that will go through various iterations where you won't exactly necessarily know that they're coming out or, or, or even recognize you know, what they're doing. I mean, I have a character in uh, the uh, Ant-Man the Wasp movie that doesn't really look a whole lot like the character that was in the uh, the comic book series that I did because I, I you know I also uh, another anniversary is uh, uh, 20 years ago tomorrow is where my very first professional comic book came out and that was uh, Crimson Dynamo number one from Marvel that led to me getting a year on Iron Man and it is the villain in my Iron Man storyline that uh, Walton Goggins plays uh, in the Ant-Man the Wasp movie. That's Sonny Birch, the character that's trying to awesome. trying to steal the uh, the you know the big the, the miniature version of the building that uh, Hank Pym has. Even though he, he doesn't really look like the character, and frequently they never do, uh, they still brought me out to the premiere, and that was kind of cool. Oh, that's and so cool! You put the name in the back, and also the uh, my my artist. Um, um, whose name, no pun intended, is Jorge Lucas. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, they brought him up from Argentina uh, for that. Uh, oh, that's so the, cool. That was five years ago. That was very cool. I do want to talk about comics in a minute, but I, I want to mention a new Don. I absolutely love Count Vidian. Oh, yes. Uh, I call him Business Vader for fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, uh, he's an efficiency expert. He absolutely is, and he's probably one of the most terrifying villains I've ever read. Yeah, when the uh, audiobook uh, came out and Jonathan, oh, God. Yeah. Jonathan Davis, uh, it, was, it wasn't Jonathan Davis, it was, uh, uh, it was uh, Thompson? Mark, Mark, Thompson. Mark Thompson. Mark Thompson. Yeah, Mark Thompson did his reading of it, and he got the first line from... Um, uh, Count Vidian, uh, he scared my cat off the couch. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, because I, I did that entire book in audiobook. Yeah. And Vidian is just probably my favorite book villain. And, and I think it's because he has all the qualities of if Darth Vader cared about capitalism. Yeah. Um, and I, and not to get too spoiler, I do love the twist about him. Oh, yeah. And so I, went, I was actually wondering about some of the inspiration behind this character because he's one of my personal just like favorite book characters. Uh, yeah, the idea about uh, New Dawn is uh, this is about how the Republic falls, turns into a totalitarian state. And basically parts of um, the Republic would have been wholesale, just transformed immediately. And then some parts were left to run. We know that major corporations still existed afterward. And so something different politically had gone on. Um, yeah, this uh, I, I joke about this because my graduate degree uh, was in Soviet studies, and uh, the reason I have a master's and not a doctorate is because the Soviet Union fell on my dissertation. I've said that line a thousand times, but it's true. I, everything that I was studying disappeared, but uh, I, I, I took some of that in writing about this because there was a period uh, where after Russia went, uh, you know, turned into the Soviet Union, where Vladimir Lenin instituted the uh, new economic policy which was to say, okay, we're not going to turn things communist just right away because yeah. everybody's going to starve. And so we're going to allow some capitalism over here and some capitalism over here and some capitalism over here. And I thought about that and I said, that's pretty much what the emperor is going to be looking to do because he's going to be deciding, well, is it better to just wholesale take things over, uh, which is sort of the, what Tarkin is, is saying to do in the Tarkin novel, or should he be getting people to compete against one another to try for... A new system of rewards that are in this uh, in this in this uh, empire, which is very uh, much a theme of like new, uh, lost stars. Yeah, actually. exactly. And so and so, you know, Vidian represents that opposite pole. To be just as diabolical, uh, making the corporations do our bidding for us, just by structuring the rewards and and the punishments the right way. Uh, and I, I just looked at him and I said, okay, this is somebody who is just absolutely going to be entirely about the bottom line, and and really he's uh, you know, he does not care about the lives of people at all because basically his uh, humanity or, or, or I don't even remember what, what a species was at this point but <laughs> his humanity is completely gone by this point. Yeah and it was also uh, the first appearance of Ray Sloan. Ray Sloan yes. Who has grown into one of the most pivotal characters especially in the sequel era. Uh, yeah she's in Star Wars Squadron she's in she's there's a Lego now uh, and I got to write her 
uh, recently in the Star Wars, uh, from a certain point of view, book for the Empire Strikes Back, mm -hmm. where she, uh, I get to actually put her in the middle of the asteroid belt scene in a story that's got one of my favorite titles for one, one of my stories. It's, uh, it's uh, Darth Vader Will See You Now. And, uh, and, you know, she actually survives that meeting, and, and she survives it by understanding that what she's got to do is she's got to succeed at things. She's got to be efficient. She, she has to have enough ambition so that nobody suspects her of, uh, of being overly ambitious, but she, uh, uh, she has to... Her whole arc is about figuring out how to navigate uh, in the Empire without actually necessarily being exactly evil. Um, no, she actually believes in some of the the goals of the uh, of the empire, and you know there was a lot of stuff that was wrong with the republic at the end, and uh, and it didn't just happen overnight. Yeah, for the last question that I wanted to ask you is, you're also known for researching comic book circulation. Yes, because that's a very specific need. Like, yeah. it's one thing to be like, I like comics, but why why comic book circulation, and why is that a, a favorite? Um, topic I yours? collected comics for years, I, and still do. I have everything I ever. Uh, you know, bought, and I used to record how many copies I had. And when I got my uh, first job almost 30 years ago in the comics industry, writing uh, magazines about the uh, the business, uh, I edited a magazine called Comics Retailer. Uh, I started tracking the sales of the business because at the time, distribution had split up between a couple of different distributors, and I was sort of bringing the sales charts together in the magazine form later for online and then when i left the company in 2007 i started a website called comicron and comicron is now the world's largest public database of comic book sales figures and i continued doing the monthly charts and also adding numbers further in the back and tracking the health of the industry and sort of debunking some misapprehensions about sales in the business over the years to give people something where they could go look at the data and say, okay, this settles it. These are actual facts. And the problem happened uh, in 2020 with the uh, pandemic yeah. and basically uh, distribution uh, fragmented in multiple directions. There is no one place to go to get all the information. None of the publishers want to cooperate. People are focusing on what I think is the wrong information. What we have now, I mean, uh, just this past week, there have been multiple websites running articles about how you know, either John or somebody else needs to get something together with all these publishers and get this data going again. Uh, I'm not certain that uh, that model is fixable now, but from my point of view, I have 80 years of data that uh, from the dawn of comic books up until you know the, the you know 2020, uh, not much of which has gotten online yet, not much of which I published. I've got a lot of things I can answer questions that nobody's ever had num uh, numbers about because I've got the data from all of my various archeological expeditions over the years. Questions like what? Uh, questions like, uh, you know, uh, 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 how many copies did the first issue of Amazing Spider-Man sell? I yeah. mean, you know, these are things, we didn't have these, this kind of tracking back then. Uh, uh, you know, wh what, was, what was the best-selling comic book of 1969, for example? They didn't have sales charts. Most people would guess it was something, some superhero comic book or something like that. It wasn't. It was Archie. And it was Archie because Archie had a hit song on the radio, Sugar Sugar, uh, by a band called the Archies. And it was also number one because there was a TV show, there was a cartoon, an animated series. And comics back then were very, very much uh, impacted by um, uh, the strength of TV shows. People assumed that Batman was always this extremely popular character. It was not. And, it was, and Batman was not. No, Batman was never number one before 1966 and the TV show. Uh, and then after the TV show was over, Batman was not popular again for a very long while. And it's really not until the 1980s when Frank Miller comes along and transforms him. And then we get Tim Burton's movies uh, that Batman becomes uh, you know, a franchise player. I mean, he was always, he was always probably DC's number two superhero. It was just Superman was way up here and Batman was, was down here. But, you know, people don't have that information where they could actually look at it easily and find it. And, you know, now we have this situation where for the first time since really 1970, uh, 1972, um, there's nothing to point to to say what the number one publisher in comics is. And uh, that is a bit by design, I think. 
Yeah, it almost reminds me of like what's going on with the streaming wars. Like they're yeah. hiding their own numbers, oh, yeah. and we don't know what it is. Oh yeah, um, we had it very well in comics, but I particularly think the pernicious thing about it is uh, comic books, like it or not, are collectibles. Uh, we're the magazines that people keep, and um, it, people, the publishers will actually market comics based on their rarity. They'll say they're collector's okay. items. And if you're gonna do that, my opinion is, if you're gonna do that, you owe it to people to say how rare the thing is. A, yeah, actually, yeah. I used to manage a comic book store, and yeah. like people would ask us questions like that. I'm like, I, I well, don't nobody have that knew, in, and in I that, don't have that information. And in the early '90s, that's what helped uh, cause problems for the business. Yeah. Oh, Death the Superman. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh gosh. I mean, it, people had people bought so many of these new comics from Valiant and other publishers where they thought it was rare, and there were a million copies. And right now, there's nobody to actually say what's rare or not. And um, you know, again. Uh, I don't care so much about the horse race. I don't care so much about the Marvel versus DC versus whatever. And I certainly don't care about people using the numbers to say you know, this genre is better than others or these characters are bad or whatever. That I'm not interested in at all. Mm -hmm. I'm only interested in, in talking about the health of the overall business and being able to say something about it and being able to give the, uh, the, the collector a fighting chance. Yeah. And also retailers. Retailers starting a new store, they don't know what to order. Yep. That's well, what we use the charts for. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Sure thing.